Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, bonjour. Thank you for joining us. Merci à tous les travailleurs et Thank you to all workers and Canadians for their efforts. Hear from Dr. New with a situation update on COVID-19 in Canada. We will hear from Minister Champagne on his efforts to get Canadians home. We will hear from Minister Garneau and Minister Bebo on making sure that we keep uh, our our farms uh, well well staffed and and running in Canada. And then we will turn to uh, we will turn to reporters for questions. Thank you. Good day. Bonjour tout le monde. Globally, there are over 275,000 cases of COVID-19 in over 185 countries. In Canada, as of this moment, there are 1,099 cases of COVID-19 and 13 deaths. In CFB Trenton, there are now 13 cases. We have tested over 83,000 people across the provinces and territories. That's another 20,000 people tested over the last two days. Nos collègues et professionnels de laboratoire de la santé publique et de soins de santé travaillent sans relâche d'un océan à l'autre pour trouver des cas, retracer les contacts et interrompre la transmission en vue de ralentir la propagation de la COVID-19. En mon nom, celui de la Dr. Tam et celui de tous les Canadiens, je tiens à les remercier de leur dévouement. Dans la même veine, nous remercions les nombreux Canadiens qui apportent leur contribution en changeant leur comportement, leur routine et leur projet pour relever ce défi national et aplatir la courbe. J'encourage tout le monde à poursuivre les, ces diligents efforts de distanciation sociale en cette période critique. Cela signifie qu'il faut maintenir une distance de deux mètres lorsque vous faites la file à l'épicerie, lorsque vous saluez un ami lors d'une promenade à l'extérieur, ou lorsque vous discutez avec des collègues de travail si vous devez vous rendre au bureau ou sur un chantier. Our public health colleagues, healthcare and laboratory professionals have been working day and night across the country to find cases, trace contacts, and interrupt transmission to slow the spread of COVID-19. On behalf of myself, Dr. Tam, and Canadians across the country, I want to thank them for their dedication. Likewise, our thanks go out to the many Canadians who are doing their part by changing behaviours and routines and disrupting plans to take on this national challenge to flatten the curve. I encourage everyone to continue with all due diligence to maintain social distancing at this critical time. This means maintaining a two-metre distance when standing in line at the grocery store, when saying hi to a friend while out for a walk, or when engaging with work colleagues should you be required at the office or job site. The time has been challenging and it's not over yet. It is still too soon, it's still too soon to say how much we have affected the trajectory for Canada, but as Canadians, we are all united in knowing that the best play is to look ahead, not give up, and go where the puck is will be going. There's no doubt our efforts are having an impact, and not making these efforts is simply not an option. Let's keep up the momentum. Let's get this right. Merci. Thank you very much, Dr. New. And now we'll turn to Minister Champagne for some words. Merci, Madame la Ministre. Bonjour à tous et à toutes qui nous regardent aujourd'hui. Merci d'être avec nous aujourd'hui dans des circonstances, disons-le, extraordinaires. Mon message s'adresse aux Canadiens et aux Canadiennes en attente de revenir au pays en raison de la situation mondiale concernant le COVID-19. Je comprends votre souhait de revenir le plus rapidement possible à la maison. Je comprends également votre anxiété face à la fermeture des espaces aériens et des frontières à travers le monde et l'annulation de nombreux vols par les compagnies aériennes vous empêchant de revenir à la maison. Sachez que nous travaillons sans relâche pour dénouer, dénouer ces situations excessivement complexes et je dirais même sans précédent. Notre priorité, ma priorité, est d'assurer le retour en toute sécurité des voyageurs canadiens qui se trouvent présentement pris à l'étranger. Depuis maintenant plusieurs jours, j'ai été en contact continu avec les dirigeants des compagnies aériennes canadiennes et internationales 
pour trouver des solutions face à l'énorme défi logistique auquel nous faisons tous face. La situation, mesdames et messieurs, change d'heure en heure. Les pays imposent des restrictions sur les vols. Les aéroports augmentent leur contrôle de sécurité. On les comprend parce que nous avons fait de même ici au Canada, parce qu'on veut tous et toutes limiter la propagation du virus, parce qu'on veut tous et toutes protéger nos populations. Au cours des derniers jours, j'ai également été en contact avec mes homologues de plus d'une quinzaine de pays pour coordonner nos efforts, y compris avec plusieurs de nos partenaires du G20, avec le, lesquels j'ai eu un troisième appel à 7 heures ce matin. J'ai notamment été en contact avec mon homologue marocain afin d'organiser le retour de Canadiens qui sont à bol du bord d'Air Canada, qui ce soir partira de Casablanca en direction de Montréal. Dans les prochains jours, d'autres vols permettront à des Canadiens de revenir du Pérou, de l'Espagne et d'ailleurs en fonction des besoins, de la capacité des transporteurs aériens et des arrangements que nous serons en mesure de négocier avec les pays concernés. Car la complexité est grande. Certains ont fermé leur espace aérien, certains ont fermé leurs frontières, certains même ont fermé leurs aéroports. Mais nous travaillons sans relâche pour assurer que les Canadiens puissent revenir à la maison. Nous faisons évidemment tout ce qui est en notre pouvoir pour ramener à la maison, comme le premier ministre le disait plus tôt, le plus grand nombre de Canadiens, évidemment le plus rapidement possible. Ceci dit, je tiens à le répéter, il ne sera malheureusement pas possible pour nous d'assurer le retour de tous les Canadiens et Canadiennes qui souhaitent revenir de l'étranger. Je rappelle que nous avons mis sur pied un programme d'urgence pour soutenir les Canadiens coincés à l'étranger suite à la pandémie par un prêt pouvant aller jusqu'à 5 000 Que ce soit pour un vol de retour ou pour des frais de subsistance, on veut vous aider dans ces moments les plus difficiles. Nous avons aussi demandé aux compagnies de télécommunications de nous aider à envoyer des messages textes aux voyageurs canadiens pour leur permettre d'accéder à cette aide le plus rapidement possible. En quelques jours, nous avons rejoint des centaines de milliers de Canadiens. Encore une fois, aux Canadiens à l'étranger, je veux que vous sachiez que nous sommes à pied d'œuvre, 24 heures sur 24, pour vous aider. En terminant, j'aimerais dire un mot à nos chers Snowbirds qui nous regardent. Je tiens à leur rappeler qu'ils devraient rentrer au pays dès que possible, surtout que les vols se font de plus en plus rares. Je tiens par ailleurs à les rassurer, tous et toutes, que la frontière sera toujours ouverte, évidemment, pour le retour au Canada. So, let me say thank you, everyone, for watching us today. We must admit, we're living some extraordinary times. I'm here today to speak to Canadians who are waiting to come back to Canada due to the global COVID-19 situation. I understand your desire to get home as quickly and as safely as possible. I understand your anxiety as you see countries around the world close their airspace or their borders and more and more airlines canceling their flights, preventing you from coming home. Please know that we are working around the clock to resolve this extremely complex and unprecedented situation. Our priority, my priority, is to ensure the safe return of Canadian travelers back home. For several days now, I've been in constant contact with representatives from Canadian and international airlines to find solutions to this enormous logistical challenge. The situation is changing, ladies and gentlemen, hour by hour. Countries impose new flight restrictions, security control are enhanced at airports. We understand why other countries do this, because we have done so as well, to limit the spread of the virus, to protect you and every other Canadians. Over the last few days, I've also been in touch with counterparts from more than 15 countries to coordinate our efforts. I also had a third call with some of my G20 partners as early as 7 o'clock this morning. Notably, I've been in touch with my Moroccan counterpart to organize the return of Canadians who will be on a flight from Casablanca to Montreal this evening. In the next days, other flights will get Canadians out of Peru Spain and elsewhere, according to the needs we identify, the capacity of our airlines, 
and the arrangements we are able to negotiate with the countries concerned. We are doing everything in our power to bring the largest number of Canadians home as quickly as possible. I must, however, repeat something I've said before. Unfortunately, it will not be possible to ensure the return of all Canadians who wish to come home. I would like to remind Canadians that we have set up an emergency loan program which provides up to $5,000 to help those Canadians stuck abroad due to this pandemic. Whether it's to help with the cost of a last-minute flight home or the unexpected costs of extended time out of the country, we want to help you in these very difficult times. We have also asked telecommunications companies to help us send text messages to Canadian travelers to help them access this help quickly. In a few days, we have reached hundreds of thousands of Canadians. Once again, to Canadians abroad, I want you to know that we are working around the clock to help you. In closing, I would like to say a word to our beloved snowbirds. I want to remind them that they should return to Canada as soon as possible, especially as flights become increasingly scarce. And I want to reassure them that the border will always be open for them to return back home in Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Champagne. And now we will turn to Minister Garneau. Thank you uh, very much. And in the interest of brevity, I won't repeat uh, things that have already, already been said. But as you all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has created an unprecedented crisis in the global aviation industry that is already having a significant impact on the air transport industry, on travelers, on shippers, and on the economy. We're working to keep the air sector flying in order to get Canadians home, as Minister Champagne stated, and also to ensure that air cargo chains are not disrupted. But right now, there is an immediate need to help to get Canadians who are stranded aboard, uh, abroad uh, due to a lack of available flights back to Canada. Upon their return, as is the case with all people entering or re-entering Canada, we are asking travellers to self-isolate for 14 days. Je dois également mentionner que tous les autres procédures doivent être suivies également, y compris s'assurer que les passagers ne présentent pas de symptômes de la COVID-19 avant d'embarquer. Les voyageurs présentant des symptômes ne pourront pas prendre l'avion. In closing, I would like to take a moment to recognize and thank workers across the transportation sector. In the face of challenges, they are continuing to keep our people and goods moving. Pilots, air crews, air traffic controllers, port workers, mariners, train crews, truck drivers, and so many others are so very critical to getting supplies to people and sustaining the Canadian economy. À mesure que la situation évolue, je sais que nous pouvons compter sur nos partenaires du secteur des transports qui travaillent avec nous au bénéfice des Canadiens et des Canadiennes afin d'assurer la mobilité des personnes et la circulation des marchandises dans les circonstances très difficiles. Merci. Thank you, Minister Garner and Minister Beeble. Thank you. <coughs> Bonjour à tous. À l'arrière, nous avons confirmé que les travailleurs étrangers temporaires seront autorisés à entrer au Canada malgré les restrictions de voyage dues à la pandémie de la COVID-19. C'est une excellente nouvelle pour les productrices et producteurs agricoles qui comptent sur eux pour cultiver leurs champs et pour les entrepreneurs qui ont désespérément besoin d'eux dans les usines de transformation alimentaire. Il s'agissait ni plus ni moins que d'un impératif de sécurité alimentaire. Over the past several days, we have heard urgent concerns about access to seasonal labor for the coming planting season. Our government is pleased to reassure farmers and food businesses that foreign workers will be allowed to enter Canada, provided they observe a 14-day period of supervised isolation. Temporary foreign workers are absolutely necessary for our farms and our agribusinesses filling over 60,000 jobs across the country. Our very food security depends on them. La prochaine étape consiste à obtenir de la part des pays d'origine de ces travailleurs des permissions de vol pour que les avions qui seront nolisés par l'industrie et payés par les employeurs puissent euh, avoir lieu. 
Our government will work with the relevant countries to obtain authorization for the flights chartered by the industry, paid by the employers. Dans l'intervalle, en collaboration avec les représentants du secteur et nos collègues des provinces, nous finalisons un protocole d'isolement supervisé. Chaque employeur aura la responsabilité de mettre en œuvre ce protocole d'isolement de 14 jours de, de façon stricte, sous peine de perdre son privilège de pouvoir engager des travailleurs étrangers pour les années à venir. Et croyez-moi, ce n'est pas ce qu'ils veulent. Dans le contexte de la pandémie de la COVID-19, je tiens à rassurer tout le monde que nous prenons toutes les mesures qui s'imposent pour protéger votre santé, tout en nous assurant aussi que vous ayez des fruits et des légumes frais, des produits transformés locaux de grande qualité sur les tablettes de vos épiceries. Et je veux aussi vous rassurer qu'il y aura toujours des emplois disponibles pour les Canadiens dans les fermes et dans les usines de transformation alimentaire. I can assure you that there will always be jobs available for Canadians who wish to work on farms and food processing plants. On a un système alimentaire fort et résilient au Canada. On va passer au travers de cette crise sans manquer de nourriture. En ces temps difficiles, c'est important de remercier les travailleurs des secteurs agricoles et alimentaires, les productrices et les producteurs agricoles, les gens qui travaillent dans les usines de transformation, les épiciers, les employés, les camionneurs, les bénévoles dans les banques alimentaires et dans les popotes roulantes, et tous ceux qui, malgré leur inquiétude, se présentent au travail tous les matins afin que nous ayons de quoi manger. Dites-leur merci la prochaine fois que vous les verrez. Prenez le temps d'apprécier à quel point leur travail est essentiel pour nous. It is important we thank all the farmers, processors, truckers, employees, employers across the agri-food value chain including volunteers in food banks and those who deliver meals on wheels. We owe them a high quality food we have on our shelves and our tables. Now, more than ever, everyone can appreciate just how essential they are to our society. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And I'll just uh, have a few closing words, and we'll turn to, to, uh, to questions. First of all, I just want to remind Canadians this is the time to remember to be kind. Now is the time to help. Now is the time to donate to a food bank. Now is the time to volunteer safely. Now is the time to donate blood. Don't stockpile food or medicine. Leave some for those that need it. These are practical ways that you can help your community right now. It is a historic time, and it's a time where people feel more alone than ever. Your government is working very, very hard to try and keep your family and loved ones healthy and safe, protect you financially, and work to find the solutions to bring a close to this time. But it is not easy, and it may get harder. And we will need all Canadians to win this war with a very fast-moving and invisible enemy. So I want to thank everyone out there. I know that people are making historic sacrifices in ways that we know and in ways that we don't know. And now we'll turn to questions from reporters. Thank you. Okay, so we'll take three questions from the room and go to the phone. One question, one follow-up. Commencez en français. Michel Lamarche, TVA. Vous avez donc annoncé que les vols de rapatriement commenceront. On peut parler d'une première vague. Il euh, y a bien des gens qui sont coincés en Équateur, qui nous parlent d'une situation là-bas extrêmement précaire. Pouvez-vous nous dire si vous avez eu des discussions avec vos homologues en Équateur, si les gens en Amérique, en Amérique du Sud euh, ou en Amérique centrale, vous allez pouvoir les rapatrier? Alors, d'abord, merci de votre question. Oui, je suis très saisi de la situation euh, présentement qui évolue en Équateur. J'ai un appel prévu avec mon homologue de l'Équateur plus tard cet après-midi. On suit cette situation-là de près. Vous savez, ce que je disais dans mes remarques plus tôt, on fait face à des circonstances sans précédent. Des espaces aériens qui ferment, des frontières qui ferment. Dans certains pays même d'Amérique du Sud, on a vu la loi martiale imposée avec des couvre-feux. Alors, ce qu'on est en train de faire pour aider les Canadiens et les Canadiennes à revenir, c'est d'abord d'avoir des appareils. Moi, je dirais que c'est l'étape 1. C'est souvent l'étape la plus simple. Ensuite de ça, c'est de négocier et de s'assurer, évidemment, que les gens puissent arriver jusqu'à l'aéroport. Donc, on doit négocier, pays par pays, un, un droit de passage pour les citoyens canadiens qui veulent revenir chez nous. Euh, comme on a fait au Pérou, je serai en contact avec mon homologue d'Équateur, et j'ai bon espoir qu'on arrive là aussi à trouver une solution pour permettre aux Canadiens de rentrer à la maison. So, um, what I was saying is that I'm very much seed of the evolving situation in Ecuador. 
as I said in my remarks, uh, we are facing something which is quite unprecedented, where uh, airspace is being closed, um, airports are closed, uh, travel restrictions are imposed. Even in some countries in Latin America, we've seen martial law being imposed with curfew. So um, we are working to uh, uh, solve this situation, uh, making sure that we can ensure that Canadians uh, can get to the airport. Like I say, the plane is usually the easiest step in all that. After that is to negotiate country by country the type of restriction they have imposed and make sure that they would give safe passage to, uh, to Canada. One of the things I did in a call this morning with a number of G20 countries, the hotspots are pretty similar for a number of like-minded nations around the world. So we have invited, for example, this morning, uh, our colleague from Morocco and Peru to give an update about the situation. We're trying to help each other because this is a very fluid situation. Uh, the circumstances on the ground evolve hour by hour, and we are uh, very much seized of the issue in Ecuador to bring Canadians back home. Comment vous, comment vous pouvez faire pour rassurer les Canadiens? Est-ce que vous pouvez d'abord leur donner euh, une idée de, de l'espace-temps dans lequel vous allez pouvoir travailler? Est-ce que c'est une question de semaines? Est-ce que c'est une question de mois? Et est-ce que vous pourriez nous dire avec quel pays vous êtes en discussion pour que les gens sachent que ça évolue Merci. pour eux sur le terrain? Merci pour votre question. Et je pense que dans des circonstances sans précédent comme celle-là, c'est important de communiquer, comme vous avez dit, Mme Lamarche, pour rassurer les gens. Euh, J'essaie de le faire constamment. Dès que j'ai un appel, j'informe les Canadiens. On a eu un appel aussi avec l'Inde ce matin pour essayer de résoudre un enjeu qui est en train de se développer. Euh, on est en contact. Évidemment, euh, les endroits qui deviennent plus problématiques à l'instant, on a certainement le Maroc, le Pérou, euh, l'Espagne, l'Équateur. Dans d'autres mesures, les Philippines, où on avait vu des enjeux se développer. Et ce que je m'engage à faire, c'est de, de mettre à jour les Canadiens et les Canadiennes aussi régulièrement que possible vous comprendrez souvent, il faut faire décision, action, information. Euh, il faut d'abord que je passe le temps à résoudre les enjeux pour permettre évidemment aux appareils, le cas échéant, de pouvoir rentrer dans l'espace aérien, de rapatrier les gens. C'est ce qu'on va faire. Mais euh, le meilleur conseil que je pourrais donner aux Canadiens, aux Canadiennes qui nous regardent, ici comme à l'étranger, c'est inscrivez-vous sur le site du gouvernement du Canada pour avoir toute l'information possible. Suivez les plateformes de médias sociaux parce qu'on met l'information au moment même où on la reçoit avec des solutions. Euh, nos ambassadeurs et ambassadrices à travers le monde constamment mettent de l'information pour les Canadiens, par exemple, parce que ce qu'on a négocié avec certains pays, c'est que les Canadiens pourraient embarquer, par exemple, sur un vol. Euh, on a eu ça euh, du côté du Maroc avec Turkish Airlines qui nous a offert à travers le ministre des Affaires étrangères de la Turquie que les Canadiens puissent arriver sur ce vol-là, ensuite transiter vers Londres ou Paris, euh, vers le Canada. On va s'assurer de maintenir des ponts aériens entre, évidemment, l'Amérique du Nord et l'Europe, l'Asie et l'Amérique latine, pour permettre au plus grand nombre de gens de revenir à la maison. On parle de jour, euh, dans les cas les plus urgents, évidemment, mais je veux dire aux gens qui nous regardent, ça dépend toujours des circonstances, des conditions, des règles qu'on nous impose sur le terrain. Et notre travail présentement, euh, jour et nuit, c'est d'essayer de régler ces situations-là pour permettre aux gens de rentrer à la maison. Ashley Burke, CBC. Um, how many Canadians do you have that have checked in abroad that want to be want you to help them get back? And as well, um, in Peru, they've said as of tomorrow that they will no longer allow anyone to be repatriated from outside of the country. There's a real sense of urgency there. I mean, the Prime Minister said this was potentially a flight going there. Can you assure families that have loved ones there that this is going to happen in that time frame? And as well, people stranded on cruise ships that can't dock, what are you going to be doing for them? So let me take the situation of Peru and be very, very, very clear with Canadians, because I think in times like that, information is key. So this morning at 7 a.m., we had a call with uh, a number of foreign ministers of the G20. I invited the Peruvian and Moroccan foreign minister to give an update uh, to make sure that we understood the conditions on the ground, because Peru and Morocco have evolved into hot spots for a number of countries in the last few days. Uh, we got reassurance at 7 a.m., let's say perhaps 7.30, I can't remember exactly when he spoke on the call, but uh, early in this morning we got reassurance uh, that flights that would bring Canadians back home would be allowed to leave the airspace and obviously to land and take passengers and leave. I am well aware that the, the Minister of Defense of uh, Peru did issue a notice after that. I did speak following that 
uh, calling back my, my counterpart, which we're going to have a further call this afternoon to make sure that this is still the case. And I called the permanent representative in New York uh, to ensure that Canadians would have safe passage. Uh, with respect to your other questions, with respect to cruise ship, uh, we're monitoring situation in a number of places around the world, as you would expect. Uh, yesterday, we were successful in bringing Canadians from Marseille uh, through cooperation with our U.S. colleagues, uh, uh, and we will continue. But obviously, all that we do needs to be subject to hold the health and safety and all the recommendations that Minister I do have been putting in place, making sure, as Minister Garneau said, that anyone who's boarding would have to be asymptomatic, they would have to self-isolate for 14 days, and we will follow every protocol that's put in place by uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, with respect to the number of Canadians, listen, this is not an exact science, um, but what I can tell you is that there's probably um, uh, tens of thousands of Canadians abroad. Um, some want to come back. Some would rather stay there. So what we're making sure is first, as the Prime Minister said this morning, and with Minister Garneau and everyone, is to try to uh, facilitate as many uh, flights back to Canada so that people can come back home. And for those that may not be able to come back, that we will continue to provide consular assistance, as we've done with respect to uh, the first cases that came in Japan and those that we had in the coast of Oakland. We will continue to support Canadians the best way we can. Real call. Um, there's been a real call on Canadians to work together through this, and, and many of you have said that that's really going to be the key to success. Today, for the first time, we saw that they're not going to be allowing, um, not going to be allowing uh, to travel between in provincial borders into the Northwest Territories. And other premiers have raised this as a possibility. Do you foresee more of that? And what does that, what is what happens to the sense of solidarity when you see requests like that? So that's a very live issue right now that we're talking about, uh, both at the uh, Public Health Officer of Canada level uh, in the Special Advisory Committee that Dr. Tam chairs with other public health officers across the country, but also uh, in many other tables. I mean, there are there are reasons why provinces may want to do that, and um, and there are fair reasons. I mean, if you have a province, for example, with no cases, you may think that you might be able to contain that province and limit the spread. Um, we do believe that there's some value in regional containment, but we also want to make sure we do it in a way that disrupt, doesn't disrupt our domestic uh, global, our domestic uh, supply chains, that domestic needs to get goods and services uh, from one part of the country to another. I know that the Prime Minister is having conversations with premiers. I am having conversations with ministers of health. Um, I think whatever we do as a country, it has to be based on the best science available, understanding that obviously things are evolving. Um, and with the focus to contain hotspots in our country of, of uh, COVID-19 infection. CTV. Uh, Ian Wood, CTV News. Um, evidence from COVID-19 hotspots like Italy is uh, indicated that even a full lockdown is not enough to keep its citizens inside. Um, how does Canada expect to plank the curve, as Dr. Tam said, with even less strict measures and isn't it time we go further to truly plank that curve? I'll answer and then I'll turn to Dr. New because I think he'll be able to speak from the science perspective. I mean, I think it's very uh, difficult to compare country to country in a very sort of rudimentary way like that. Italy took a number of measures early on that created a crisis for them that we, quite frankly, didn't see. Not to say that we're not concerned about the increase in cases. Um, as Dr. Tam mentioned yesterday, though, the cases that we see right now are actually a reflection of what was happening two weeks ago. So I think we'll have a better sense of whether the measures we've put into place are working in the next, I'd say, seven to ten days. Um, those conversations are happening around more stringent measures, but I would say that they have to be applied in ways that make sense to continue the functioning of society. And when I say that, what I mean is, obviously, we have hot spots in Canada that we need to keep our eye on, and I know that provinces are working very hard to figure out how to do that, and we're there with them to talk about measures that they can take. But it does not make sense from my perspective as a health minister to put an entire country on lockdown if, in fact, we uh, don't have the need to do so from a science perspective. In fact, it could create even more harm. People still need to eat. 
We still need things to get across the country from place to place. You've heard about the challenges that our farms and our food producers are having with labour. These are real challenges as well. And obviously the steps that we take have to be measured to balance all of those perspectives while also doing the absolutely best we can to contain the virus in, 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 the, in, in the locations that it's at. So those conversations are happening right now. Will there be additional measures? There very well might be. Um, but at this point, uh, those conversations are ongoing and it's too early to, uh, to uh, hypothesize what those might be. I'll turn to Dr. New for some of the science behind that. Sure. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Minister. Uh, exactly as the Minister said, at, at the technical level, the Special Advisory Committee, on which both Dr. Tam and I sit, along with uh, the Chief Medical Officers of Health of all the provinces and territories, we're, we're having very live conversations. And one of the things is that we're always looking at the science and the public health principles. So the idea of social distancing, we're obviously uh, pushing that out, saying that it's uh, important for every Canadian to have a role to play. But we're also looking at very, uh, very important vulnerable settings. So. Things such as long-term care facilities, that's a hot spot. We're all aware of the outbreak that occurred in, in, in Vancouver. So those types of vulnerable settings we need to pay special attention to. And it's interesting, even the last question, you can see how that principle applies to the Northwest Territory. Because that, in, in a way, you could consider a vulnerable setting because of their infrastructure, their limited access to health care services. It's the same, uh, same principle. Should a case occur there, it would be much more uh, challenging to deal with. Uh, in, the same, in the same vein, it would be challenging to deal with a case in a long-term care facility. So the principles apply. We're working very closely in terms of what kind of measures need to be taken across the country, depending on context. So certainly in provinces like Ontario and British Columbia, uh, where they are in, in sort of the, the pandemic uh, with uh, hot spots, uh, community clusters, that's where the focus needs to be. In other provinces, they have relatively few cases. I'm aware in the Atlantic provinces, uh, uh, most of their cases, if not all, are related to travel, and therefore their focus might be looking at symptomatic travelers coming back to those jurisdictions. But uh, as uh, Minister Haidu has said, we're obviously uh, looking at it day by day. Our special advisory committee has met several times. We're having another meeting again tomorrow on a weekend and then during the week. And we're continuing to uh, look at and obviously uh, uh, change and modify our, our public health actions as, as appropriate. And I just wanted to follow up on uh, a question of ventilators. Um, we've not had a number so far on nationally how many ventilators are available. And there's been a patchwork of numbers from provinces on what, how many provinces have. So to give Canadians a sense of preparedness in terms of our stockpiles, how many ventilators does this country have ready to go? I could answer with a quick answer, but I'm going to unpack that a bit. So certainly at the planning we're doing at the, at the technical level, we have to understand the epidemiology, what's happened in other countries and also experience here in Canada. So certainly from the science we have to date, uh, most people that get uh, COVID-19 actually have a relatively mild illness. It can be actually treated at home and never need to go to the hospital, and that's about 80%. And then you get, the, uh, obviously, a smaller percentages that need medical care, might need hospitalization, and in the worst case, may need to be in an ICU and have, a, uh, have a assisted breathing through a ventilator. So all those calculations are there. One of the other things we look at in terms of our projections is, is what we call the attack rate. And that's something where, it, that's why it's so critical now in terms of our social distancing. The attack rate can be changed by what we do now. If we do nothing at all, no control measures, no social distancing, the attack rate will be much higher than if we actually implement measures such as that. So based on the, on, on the attack rate, based uh, on whether we do uh, social distancing measures or not, we are also modeling. So uh, in terms of the estimates, uh, you know, Canadian population, uh, we estimate that, uh, you know, the, the, the need for ventilators could be anywhere from, you know, 1,000 to 3,000 to 5,000, whatever it might be, depending on the scenario. But that's the other part that's important because if you look at the healthcare system planning, it's not just about the total number of ventilators, it's when you would have to actually use them. The thing is that's why flattening the curve is so important because if you actually, let's say for uh, example, uh, a thousand people need a ventilator if you have a serious case of COVID-19. There's a difference of all those thousand people occur in a matter of a few days compared to spread out over several weeks and months. So that's, that's part of the thinking that we want to do across Canada stretch it out, spread out the, the actual uh, you know, severe cases that the healthcare system could deal with. So that's on the, on the planning side in terms of how many ventilators we may need. The other part also is that they're a machine. So even if you had, you know, how many ventilators, it's not just about having them in their boxes. They actually need to be in rooms in hospitals. So there's a lot of planning that needs to go in terms of how many rooms can be freed up. That's why many uh, provinces are looking at 
freeing up beds by, you know, canceling non-elective surgeries. So lots of sort of things that are in the mix rather than just, quote, focusing on the number of ventilators. And then, of course, when you actually have the vent ventilators, you need to have trained staff, people know how to use them, and, of course, how you distribute them depending on the situation. At the federal level, we're, we're working closely with our counterparts. We've done estimates. Uh, the federal government is buying, I think, uh, right now about 500 ventilators to, to actually support should there be a need to maybe distribute the ventilators depending on a hot spot somewhere in the country. Uh, there's also, as Dr. Tan mentioned yesterday, a mutual assistance agreement in place. Should there need to be a need for one province to request ventilators or even personnel or, or other resources from one province to another? So that's all in the planning phase. But the, the short answer then is that with all that in the mix, uh, the number of ventilators at the current time, we're still doing the inventory, is about 5,000 across the country. Okay, we'll turn to the phone. Thank you. Merci. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. S'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile 1 maintenant pour toute question. There will be a brief pause while the participants register for questions. Il y aura un court délai vous permettant de vous enregistrer dans la file d'attente pour la période des questions. Thank you for your patience. Merci de patienter. Our first question, that's première question, is from Lynn. Other kinds of suffering for those particular residents of that province or, or uh, region. Um, we need to keep the flow of goods and services happening in our country as well. We need to make sure that people can work, that they can work from region to region. Uh, I think there is nothing wrong with asking Canadians who can do so to stay put right now, and I think Dr. Tam has said that. Please stay home if you do not have a need to travel in the this country or out of this country, obviously, please stay home. And I think that is important no matter where you live. But uh, let's be realistic. Also, we need essential services to be traveling across this country. We need to be able to move food and other essential goods across this country. So we have to do this together. We have to do it in a way that's coordinated. And we have to be using the epidemiology in a way that's going to guide our decisions. And I will just point to China as an example, an early example. You know, China took some of the most um, uh, extraordinary measures at the beginning of this outbreak, as you can recall. But they didn't close down their country. What they did was really target in where they saw their hot spots so that they could keep the rest of the country functioning. Um, it's, you know, none of this is perfect. Obviously, uh, this is, this is you know, based on human behavior, and we do live in a democracy. But we, uh, we know that Canadians are up for this challenge, and we know that they will respect these, these, uh, these pleas that we're giving to them, that they need to take this seriously for the health and safety of their family and their loved ones and for their fellow Canadians. So I will turn to uh, uh, Minister Garneau, who would like to take the first translation. Thank you. Merci. Uh, dans le même sens que c'est essentiel pour nous de maintenir uh, le transport du, du commerce entre le Canada et les États-Unis, la même logique s'applique pour tout le Canada. Nous sommes le deuxième plus gros pays au monde, avec uh, énormément d'espace uh, pour le transport. Et c'est absolument essentiel que nos corridors de transport et de commerce restent ouverts pour transporter à travers le Canada, non seulement par camion, par train et par d'autres modes, euh, par avion, euh, les biens essentiels dont notre pays a besoin. Alors, pour ces raisons-là, euh, c'est important de garder une certaine ouverture dans nos frontières provinciales et de continuer à faire ce transport pour, uh, pour le bien-être des Canadiens et pour l'économie. Merci, Minister. Oui. Peut-être, euh, peut c'est Dr. New, je peux ajouter quelque chose en français. Euh, je ne veux pas répéter et souligner que les ministres ont déjà dit, mais euh, je pense que c'est important. Si, euh, on parle de l'échelle euh, technique euh, de santé publique. Euh, on a toujours le, le, le comité consultatif spécial. Euh, avec euh, et Dr. Tam et moi, on travaille étroitement avec nos homologues. Euh, C'est aussi euh, Dr. Arruda qui est très, très <rire> connu maintenant au Québec. Et euh, on, 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 on discute toujours les enjeux pour avoir une cohérence. Si on parlait des principes et une approche de santé publique, c'est important d'avoir une cohérence parce que les, les principes de, de la distanciation sociale, ça s'applique au Québec et même en Ontario. Et euh, pour les raisons même personnelles, c'est... Ça ne fait pas de sens parce que mes deux fils habitent actuellement à Montréal. Mmh. C'est tout. Je peux <rire> dire maintenant. Euh, donc, 
Donc, si je peux relancer, donc je comprends, docteur Nou, vous n'avez pas de, un nouveau, une nouvelle statistique pour euh, le nombre de transmissions communautaires. Et ma sous-question, euh, c'est, on, a, on l'a fait avec les États-Unis. Alors, pourquoi pas ne, ne limiter le, les déplacements au Canada que pour les déplacements essentiels, donc les marchandises, le commerce, les travailleurs, et boucler tout le reste, comme on l'a fait avec les Américains, comme on le fait avec le reste de la planète, entre les provinces. Bon, je, peux, je, peux, je pense que peut-être souligner les points que les ministres ont déjà faits, c'est important aussi de, 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 de continuer, comme dire, la, la, la chaîne logistique, la, la, la transportation des biens et des services essentiels à, à travers le pays. C'est, c'est important parce qu'on est un pays. Moi, je pense qu'aussi, de, si on parle d'une, d'une cohérence, je pense qu'en fin de compte, on, on est tous des Canadiens. Ce n'est pas des Ontariens ou des Québécois, on est tous des Canadiens. On a parlé aussi de, de, d'un, d'un effort. Je pense qu'hier, on a dit, quelqu'un dit que c'est, un, c'est comme un effort, un warlike effort, un effort de guerre. Je pense que c'est aussi une, une mentalité, une, une attitude que je pense que ce n'est pas seulement le secteur privé ou le gouvernement, c'est tous les, Cana- tous les Canadiens et Canadiennes. Si on a les mêmes, les mêmes objectifs, on, 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 on tient tout, tout le monde dans la même direction. C'est même c'est peut-être les, les, les générations plus vieux qui... qui qui savent déjà qu'est-ce qui, qu'est-ce qui demande comme sacrifice pour, pour un, un défi comme ça. Maintenant, c'est, c'est, c'est le, 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 l'ennemi, c'est un virus. Je pense que ça, c'est la, la mentalité, l'attitude qu'il faut avoir à travers le pays. OK, I'm trying, I'm trying to think. Uh, um, certainly, uh, even in this country, it's important to, to maintain... Uh, Uh, how you say the supply chains, uh, essential goods and services uh, uh, in terms of uh, across the country, because certainly uh, goods and services in one part of the country are, are needed, uh, maybe manufactured in one province, are needed in, in another. I think uh, to sum up, I think at the end of the day, we're all Canadians. You know, we're not Ontarians or Quebecers. Or we're all on the same team, Team Canada. And I think uh, the reference was made yesterday in terms of a war effort. And I think it was, it was put in the context of industry in terms of wrapping up or, or, or retooling in terms of the kinds of products that Canada needs. I would say that same mentality applies to all Canadians. I think uh, the older generations may know better in terms of what it takes in terms of the sacrifice and what all Canadians need to do in terms of a wartime effort. So I think uh, I would exhort all Canadians, think of it that way. We're all in the same fight, in the same war against the virus, and everyone has a role to play. Okay, next question on the phone. Just a friendly reminder, one question, one follow-up. Thank you. Next question. La prochaine question is from Alex Ballingham from Toronto Star. La prochaine question est de Alex Ballingham de Toronto Star. Hi, just on the, um, on the race for a vaccine, uh, what is Canada doing to accelerate the push to, to get a vaccine for this? And, uh, and when, do you think, um, when do you think that will happen? I'll, I'll give some general comments. I don't know if Dr. New has more detailed comments, but I will say that early on, we've been investing uh, in, r- early on. <laughs> feels like every day is a week, doesn't it? But uh, very early on, we knew that we had to get our researchers and our scientists in the game of vaccine development and have the money and the tools and the capacity to uh, to be present in that space of working on vaccines, but more than vaccines on treatments as well. And so uh, it, it seems like a lifetime ago, but two or three weeks ago, uh, I was with many of my colleagues in Montreal making an announcement of the initial down payment on that investment. And since then, we've put another $300 million towards uh, the great projects that were already, uh, that had been applied for. We were astounded by the number of uh, projects that came in. And I want to thank all the researchers and scientists that both applied for money, but then also volunteered countless hours to peer review all of those applications to make sure they were quality, quality applications. And what we found was that there were more applications than we had money for. So we immediately found more money to fund all of those scientists and researchers to do that work. Uh, that work is not happening in isolation. Canada is also working on an international stage on this and contributing our science and our research uh, to the international work that's happening. Everybody's searching for the cure and everybody's searching for it in two ways. One, through a vaccine and two, through any kinds of medical treatments that could lessen the severity of the symptoms for those people most seriously affected. The other piece of research that's 
really important is people are looking at uh, how we actually get out of this uh, if we are not able to find a vaccine in short order. And so there is a lot of research happening around um, social distancing methods and how we move forward in the next uh, stage to manage any second wave of this particular virus. This is a long-term project. Um, there are some promising things happening. There are some vaccine trials happening already now, um, limited uh, nonetheless, but still promising. Uh, there are two or three medications that are being tested as we speak. Um, but of course, we'll, and, and we've accelerated our processes here in Canada, by the way, um, uh, various regulate, regulatory processes uh, to make sure that we can get access very quickly, that we can um, ensure that we can uh, we can facilitate those, those, uh, those clinical trials as quickly as possible. But let me be clear, uh, the vaccine and treatment piece may be, uh, may be still quite far in the distance. I hope I'm wrong. I hope that uh, I hope that scientists and researchers have a miraculous breakthrough sooner. But the estimates that we are seeing are somewhere in the range of 12 to 18 months. Dr. New, do you have anything further? Not really. I think you've said it very well, Minister Haidu. I, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's unprecedented what's been happening in the scientific world. It's been mere barely, I think, uh, two and a half months or so since the Chin Chinese scientists have first discovered the actual sort of a cause of the, the unknown pneumonia at the time. It was a virus and then actually uh, published a genetic sequence. And since that time, it's been, you know, the start line go scientists around the world taking that and, and, and putting their best efforts forward. And uh, I think it's not just Canada alone, obviously. I don't think, uh, you know, one country is going to, quote, figure out and, and deliver the vaccine on its own. It's really a global effort. Uh, people have seen that uh, WHO announced that there are, I think, are 30 or so uh, vaccine candidates. Uh, there are various trials around the world. Uh, NIH, United States, it really is a global effort. And to the point that Canada can contribute to that in a coordinated fashion with, with other partners around the world, that's what we're all striving for. Uh, similar to Minister Haidu, uh, I think the estimates at the beginning uh, were that uh, for a vaccine would take at least a good 12 to 18 months. But uh, even now, with clinical trials starting now, a bare two and a half months later, we're hopeful, optimistic. But uh, we have to be realistic as well. And just as a follow-up on that, um, I, I guess, like, in terms, once we, uh, the, somewhere in the world, sort of nails down a vaccine that works, um, how will Canada ensure that, that uh, our citizens and that people around the world that need it um, actually have access to the medicine that can, that can be effective against this virus? So that uh, that's an excellent question. That's, that's why we're investing so heavily in this space as well, because we need to be at the ground level of developing the vaccine and part of that global participation. And the more that countries share their knowledge and their research and their efforts, the more uh, likely that it will be a shared solution and the more likely it will be uh, a shared uh, a shared vaccine as well. So that's why it's so critical that Canada is involved in the research and the science piece around both uh, finding antidotes and and looking for vaccine potentials. Um, if we don't participate in that space, then we for sure would be left out, and that has been part of our consideration. Thank you. Merci. Our next question is from Melanie Marquis. The next question is from Melanie Marquis, de La Presse. Bonjour. Euh, ma question est pour euh, M. Champagne. D'abord, on commence à recevoir beaucoup de courriers de, de gens qui, euh, qui nous disent être pris au, euh, au Mexique dans des destinations au soleil comme euh, Huatulco ou Acapulco. Pouvez-vous juste nous faire le bilan euh, de la situation là-bas? Puis aussi, parlant de, de rapatriement, Mme Bibot, si vous pouviez préciser les, les pays d'où proviendraient les travailleurs saisonniers temporaires, puis à partir de quand est-ce que vous euh, vous attendez aux premiers, euh, aux premiers arrivages? Alors, sur, sur votre question pour le Mexique, pour vous donner une idée, on reçoit dans les derniers 48 heures environ 10 000 appels et 14 000 messages. Donc, euh, quand je vous dis qu'on a des, des endroits dans le monde qui sont particulièrement chauds en termes de, de demandes euh, pour des services consulaires, évidemment, il faut comprendre euh, qu'il y a des Canadiens des Canadiennes un peu partout dans le monde. Ce que je peux vous dire présentement, c'est que comme il y a encore des vols commerciaux euh, avec le Mexique, il semble que cette situation-là est encore sous contrôle euh, parce que d'abord et avant tout, pour être clair avec les Canadiens et les Canadiennes, ce qu'on conseille, ce qu'on recommande, ce qu'on suggère, c'est évidemment que les gens, euh, on a déjà émis l'avis de rentrer à la maison et c'est de regarder toutes les, po les possibilités commerciales avec le ministre Garneau. Évidemment, on suit ça de très près pour assurer qu'il y a encore des vols commerciaux disponibles. 
Je pense que la situation au Mexique, il y a encore une capacité de vols commerciaux pour revenir. Mais comme je vous dis, euh, Madame Marquis, cette situation-là, elle évolue d'heure en heure. Si on voit un problème particulier, bien évidemment, on sera là pour y répondre. Pour ce qui est des travailleurs étrangers, ils viennent principalement du Mexique, du Guatemala, euh, de la Jamaïque et quelques autres pays des Caraïbes. On s'attend que ça puisse commencer peut-être d'ici quelques semaines. Et je vous rappelle que ce sont des initiatives qui sont menées par l'industrie, donc par euh, Ferme au Québec, Farm Canada. Alors vraiment, ce sont les représentants de l'industrie qui, euh, qui sont en charge de mener l'opération. Notre rôle est simplement, de, simplement mais ce n'est pas si simple, d'obtenir les autorisations de voyage. Merci. Um, Mr. Haidu, if I may, I think I heard you say the Prime Minister is in talks and discussion with his uh, counterparts in the provinces and territories. Was that, was that too um, about the uh, closing the borders, potentially? Was that what you meant? And if so, if they are talking about it, when can we expect a decision? Well, no, uh, I, I should be clear. The prime minister is in constant contact with premiers, obviously, through this crisis, and many things have uh, have been discussed. I'm sure uh, that how we move forward in containing the virus is one of them. I, what I meant to imply was that at all levels we are in conversations with our counterparts. So I have a regular conversation with the ministers of health, uh, at least weekly, uh, most often biweekly. Also, ministers of health have my cell phone number, so I have many bilateral calls with ministers of health from various affected provinces and some that are not. Um, and I, I, I know the Prime Minister is having those conversations as well. Um, what I am hoping and what we are encouraging through the work that Dr. Tam and Dr. New are doing through the Public Health Officers uh, Working Group is to make sure that we have a coordinated approach that is based on protecting citizens on the science uh, of containment so that we not, uh, as Dr. New mentioned earlier, um, cutting off our nose to spite our face, quite frankly. What we really want to do is make sure that the containment measures that we implement work and don't make things worse uh, and don't interrupt uh, supply chains domestically. So those conversations are ongoing. Uh, we are obviously very aware of the fact that we have some areas with uh, extra vulnerability, whether it's northern communities and also areas that have extra activity in terms of the virus and its spread. Uh, not every community is, even though it may have high numbers, in the same boat. Uh, for example, in Vancouver, they have a number of cases that are directly linked to three long-term care homes. Those are very specific situations. And so it's it's easy, I think, from the outside to say we should do this or put a wall around that or we should, you know, contain this particular area. But these decisions need to be driven through the best public health science because what we want to do is take measures that are appropriate to the risk, that are going to protect the health and safety of Canada's, uh, Canadians and not actually introduce Uh, new challenges or even uh, worse conditions of, of virus spread that may be unanticipated if we act without using the science. Thank you. Next question on the phone. Thank you. The next question is from Maya Rapsut from the Canadian Press. Hi. Good morning. A uh, question uh, first for Minister Champagne, I believe. Um, I'm just uh, curious, this morning the Prime Minister said that uh, people should not go to airports in foreign countries if they don't have a confirmed seat, but several airlines are telling people in these countries that they can't book online, they can't book on their phones because they're overloaded and they have to go to the airport. So they're getting a mixed message. I'm just wondering what you, should be, what you can say to them. Well, the best advice I would say, um, as I said earlier, register with, with our website because, as you would appreciate, uh, the situation is evolving Uh, country by country, sometimes regions within a country, and sometimes from airports to airports. So there's not one size fit all when it comes to that. I think the best possible thing, and I'll let Minister Garneau may want to add to that, but uh, the, the best possible thing I would say is, is make sure you register, make sure you, you follow us and the embassies in particular jurisdictions, because uh, these measures, even if I was to tell you what's the situation now, uh, an hour from now, that may not be the case, uh, because You know, countries decide on the basis of, of their own health and safety of their citizens. So I would say, generally speaking, um, making sure that people have a book flight uh, is a good thing in terms of knowing whether it is worthwhile for you to go to the airport. But I would say, more generally speaking, make sure you are well informed. And one system that we have been 
uh, putting in place is a system of text messaging in the phone of Canadians abroad in particular jurisdiction. Uh, that's also a very good source of information. When we're going to send um, planes in some jurisdictions, uh, we will push out a message to Canadian abroad. That's probably the best thing. I would say keep your phone open and charged so that we make sure that we tell you well in advance, as we've done in Morocco. And I was just informed that our flight has landed in uh, Casablanca and will take off in a couple of hours. That's kind of the model we're going to be following for the jurisdictions where we have a critical mass of Canadians to bring back home. Uh, and I would just add that the approach that we're taking to flights such as the one that just landed in Casablanca is that uh, those who want to catch that flight back from Casablanca do it online with Air Canada. That is by far the cleanest and simplest way to do it, and uh, that is what we've been encouraging people to do. Uh, okay, and a uh, question for Dr. New. I believe you said early on in this briefing uh, that, quote, there is no doubt our efforts are making a difference, uh, even though we may not be seeing them in the numbers right now. But can you maybe just reassure Canadians what you mean by that? I mean, a lot of people have stayed home this week and are wondering, you know, is this actually doing something? Well, as uh, we've said, uh, it remains to be seen, obviously, because uh, even the cases that we see right now, mm -hmm are actually a result of exposures or what happened to, uh, to Canadians uh, about up to two weeks ago. So by putting uh, all the measures in, I think we're, I, I think, uh, we're very uh, I think appreciative of, of, the, of the great efforts Canadians are making is the fact that uh, we're seeing the uh, social distancing happening, you know, in terms of how people are, are you know, canceling play dates and making sure that if they do go outside for, for a walk, it really is sort of, uh, you know, with the sort of the distance of two meters uh, uh, you know, from others and so on. So that's what we're seeing right now in terms of Canadians taking up the, the challenge, I can call it, in terms of social distancing. And, of course, we'll see, uh, obviously, hopefully, uh, in a positive way, what the effects are uh, a few weeks uh, down the road. The other point also I'd like to stress, and I think Minister Champagne and others have already uh, mentioned that, is that uh, we need to pay special attention to the snowbirds that are coming back and people on cruise ships and so on. Obviously, from coming abroad, uh, these people in other parts of the world may well have been exposed. So I think uh, we need to remind them, reinforce the message that any returning Canadian coming to Canada has to go into self-isolation for 14 days. And I will just say, I understand that people uh, are frustrated and they're at home and they're not doing things that they normally do and they're not seeing their loved ones. But now is the time to double down, actually, because one week is not enough. Uh, we will start, as Dr. New uh, indicated, to see if these efforts are making a difference in the next uh, week to two weeks. Um, and we'll, we'll report back. But that doesn't mean that the social distancing will be lifted. Uh, we will be in this situation for a while. And I think Canadians need to understand this isn't about two weeks of social distancing. This is, this is about months of social distancing. And that's why um, Minister Morneau, in the last several days, uh, made the announcement that he made about uh, financial assistance for Canadians, understanding that there are going to be a tremendous amount of layoffs. This is going to be hard for us. This is going to be hard for us as a society. This is going to be hard for us financially. But I have every, de I have, I have every confidence that we will, we will get through this together. And and that we will come back, uh, we will bounce back, and that our communities will be stronger than ever. But now is not the time to take your foot off the social distancing measures. Thank you. Next question on the phone as well, please. Thank you. Merci. The next question, the prochaine question, is from Philippe de Vincent-Foisy from Radio-Canada. Première question sur les, les avions dans les pays. Comment vous allez choisir ceux qui rentrent au pays? Est-ce que c'est premier arrivé, premier servi? Est-ce que vous allez vous baser sur les facteurs les plus à risque, les personnes les plus âgées vont pouvoir rentrer en premier? Est-ce qu'il y a un tri qui s'opère en ce moment euh, ou qui va s'opérer dans les prochains jours? Puis avez-vous une proportion là, de gens qui vont pouvoir rentrer et de gens qui ne pourront pas rentrer? Alors oui, tout à fait, il y a un certain tri qui se fait, c'est pour ça qu'on travaille avec Air Canada en particulier, mais on travaille aussi avec les ambassades et les consulats pour s'assurer que ce soit euh, d'abord des voyageurs canadiens euh, qui soient sur nos vols. Il y a aussi des gens qui pourraient être dans des situations vulnérables. C'est pour ça que quand je disais que c'est important, ceux qui nous regardent à la maison, de s'enregistrer, parce que ça permet d'évaluer les situations particulières auxquelles certains Canadiens et Canadiennes pourraient faire face. On a, par exemple, des élèves dans certains pays qui veulent rentrer au pays. On a des personnes qui ont besoin de soins médicaux particuliers. 
euh, qui était à l'étranger pour une courte période et qui se trouve présentement pris à l'étranger. Donc, la meilleure chose, c'est de contacter l'ambassade. Comme ça, oui, on est en train de, évidemment, garder des sièges sur ces appareils-là pour des situations particulières, parce que c'est la chose intelligente à faire et la bonne chose à faire dans les circonstances. Euh, je ne peux pas vous donner de proportion parce que euh, la situation évolue de jour en jour, parce que vous comprenez, c'est... Euh, Tant qu'il y aura des vols commerciaux dans une juridiction en particulier où les gens peuvent sortir, bien ça, ça permet aux gens de rentrer comme ça. Nous, où on regarde présentement, c'est dans des endroits où, comme je le disais plus tôt, euh, il y a des espaces aériens fermés, il y a des aéroports fermés, euh, il y a des frontières qui sont fermées. Dans le fond, vous avez des gens pris euh, sans, sans avoir commis aucune faute, c'est-à-dire qu'ils veulent rentrer, mais il y, a, il y a des circonstances exceptionnelles dans la juridiction où ils se trouvent qui leur empêchent de revenir sur des moyens commerciaux. Alors, il n'y a pas vraiment de proportion parce qu'on regarde ce qui se passe, mais ce que je peux vous dire présentement à l'heure qu'on se parle, c'est clair que le cas du Maroc, le cas du Pérou, le cas de l'Équateur aussi qu'on est en train de vérifier. Et à chaque fois avec les autorités aériennes, avec le ministre Garneau, mes autres collègues, qu'on voit une situation se développer, on intervient d'abord pour faire débloquer la situation. Et cas échéant, si on n'est pas capable de la débloquer, bien, on pense à d'autres solutions. Ce qui est clair pour les gens, c'est qu'on est en mode solution à toutes les étapes du processus pour permettre aux gens de rentrer au pays. Et euh, la capacité que vous avez, est-ce qu'on peut s'attendre à ce que quoi, une centaine de personnes rentrent au pays chaque jour, à ce qu'il y en ait des milliers après quelques jours? Donc, en termes de capacité, vous voyez le rapatriement se faire comment? Puis ceux qui sont malades, ceux qui ont la COVID-19 en ce moment à l'étranger, vous les laissez là dans certaines régions où les soins de santé ne sont pas parfaits, ne sont pas euh, adéquats ou comparables, du moins aux nôtres. Vous leur dites quoi à ces gens-là? Alors, sur votre première question, en termes de chiffres, je pense qu'on parle plus au cours des prochains jours, des prochaines semaines, de milliers de personnes. Évidemment, ça va dépendre de, de voir comment on est capable de... de d'avoir les autorisations d'atterrir, d'envoyer les appareils. Vous savez, souvent, c'est des appareils de grande capacité. On parle souvent des, des Boeing 777 avec ce qu'on appelle haute densité, donc 400 quelques passagers. Euh, le ministre Garneau connaît mieux, euh, connaît même mieux ça que moi, mais certainement, on a euh, une grande capacité dans ces appareils-là. Euh, sur votre autre question, je vous dirais, la situation... C'est un peu semblable lorsqu'on a eu, vous vous rappelez, le Diamond Princess au Japon où les gens ont dû être hospitalisés sur place. C'est clair que les gens, comme la ministre Aydou le disait, la politique sanitaire qui s'applique est la même pour tout le monde. C'est-à-dire que c'était le cas aussi lorsqu'on a vu les premiers cas, vous vous rappellerez à Wuhan, ce qu'on a vu au Japon, c'était dire que seulement les passagers qui étaient asymptomatiques, c'est-à-dire qu'ils n'avaient pas de symptômes, pouvaient monter à bord parce qu'évidemment, on doit assurer la santé et sécurité de tout le monde, c'est-à-dire de ces gens-là, mais aussi des autres passagers qui pourraient être à l'intérieur de l'appareil et aussi, vous comprendrez, des membres d'équipage qui font un travail exceptionnel dans les circonstances. Donc, ceux qui devront rester sur place seront accompagnés avec nos, euh, nos, euh, notre personnel consulaire. Euh, on parle aussi, par exemple, avec la Croix-Rouge. On est vraiment en contact avec toutes les instances pour voir comment on peut mieux appuyer ces gens-là durant une période qui est particulièrement difficile. Merci. Prochaine question. Thank you. Our next question is from James Keller. Notre prochaine question est de James Keller from the Global Mail. Hi there. Uh, I know Saskatchewan is uh, threatening tra returning travelers with $2,000 fines. There's apparently been an arrest in Quebec from a COVID-19 patient who refused to self-isolate. So what do you think of using enforcement and fines and other penalties to uh, enforce this public health advice? Do you think it's something that we require at the federal level? And what do you think of efforts sort of regionally and locally to do the same? And this is probably a question for the health minister and Dr. Noon. Um, well, thank you for the question. I, I was just surprised to hear the Saskatchewan um, detail. It was something I wasn't aware of. But I will say that each province and territory has their own quarantine act, which has significant penalties for violations of quarantines, and it's within their jurisdiction to apply those. The federal quarantine act also has those. Um, we, uh, it, you know, these are very. Uh, very uh, strong pieces of legislation that provide the various jurisdictions quite a bit of discretion in terms of how they will apply it and how they will assess the penalties. And so I can't comment on those specific cases clearly because I hadn't, I wasn't aware of them. But I will say that people need to know that we, and we are saying self-isolate uh, for 14 days, uh, that it is a significant um, 
uh, request, and in some cases it is uh, mandatory depending on their jurisdiction and depending on uh, their province's particular statements. Um, obviously, at the federal level, we have recommended strongly that people self-isolate. Uh, should we see any sense that that is not happening, we will not hesitate to take stronger measures. Uh, at this particular time, though, we, uh, we know that Canadians are, uh, by and large, complying. We are actually looking at additional measures to make that crystal clear to returning Canadians and those who are coming off of cruise ships. Yeah, and I'm going to say something that's kind of obvious, but the reason we ask people to self-isolate is to protect other people. That is the main reason. And um, even if a person may feel fine, the reason we ask them to self-isolate is to protect other people. You think get that's, the sense, Dr. New, that uh, people, there are people that aren't taking this seriously. I mean, we've all heard anecdotal stories of people who are, you know, mm. playing fast and loose with the rules or just ignoring them altogether. Yeah, but just similar to what uh, Minister Haidu said, certainly uh, from a public health perspective, uh, I think uh, all of our counterparts in the provinces and territories, we're all on the same page in terms of, uh, you know, exhorting the population, uh, taking whatever means in terms of uh, messaging and, and, and increasing awareness, informing people that it's the right thing to do in terms of social distancing. In terms of, uh, you know, stronger tools, be it legislations and so on, that's usually what we call a, you know, measure of last resort. Uh, the Federal Quarantine Act really applies to, quote, our borders, the international borders in terms of specific powers that the federal government has. But then within each province and, and territory, there are public health uh, legislations that uh, do permit public health authorities to take stronger actions as appropriate and necessary to protect public health. So. That, that's all I can say. And the only thing I would add to that is that, uh, you know, people talk about social distancing as, as, as if it's a bad thing. And I, I, I want to also emphasize that, you know, it's a physical thing. Social distancing, you know, as a, as a physical, you know, tool, I can I call it in terms of, uh, of separating people to uh, minimize a possible transmission uh, or further spread. That's not the same thing as social solidarity. And I really think that's one of the things we want to stress. Social solidarity is much more important than just sort of this tool of social distancing. And I'll, I'll just add a final thought about that. I think what Canadians, I think Minister Garneau and Dr. New are completely right. We're asking people to self-isolate because it is to protect their family, their loved ones, their community from the potential of uh, contracting this illness. And yes, you know, the majority of these cases will be mild to moderate, but there are many people in our communities that will have a more severe ex uh, expression of this disease up to and including dying from it. And that's what we're all trying to do. And you cannot predict uh, when you are uh, symptomatic who it is that's going to die as a result of the work, the, the traveling around that you may you may choose to do. And finally, I will just say that when people are playing uh, loose and hard with the rules like this, it does actually put our civil liberties at jeopardy. It makes governments have to look at more and more stringent measures to actually contain people in their own homes. So actually, our freedoms around the measures that we're taking right now depend on people taking them seriously, because politicians and governments will be pushed to a place to take more and more stringent measures when people violate them and don't take this seriously. So I would encourage Canadians to think about that and to think about their obligation to act collectively right now. Right now is your chance to act collectively. As Dr. Tam has been saying for days, the time is now for us to take action together. Thank you, Minister. We'll take three last questions on the phone and we're going to wrap it up. Thank you. Our next question is from Christian No. Notre prochaine question is de Christian Noël de Radio Canada. Bonjour, uh, Monsieur, Mesdames, les Ministres. Uh, ma question est sensiblement celle la, la même, mais en français. Pourquoi est-ce que les gens doivent prendre ça au sérieux maintenant? Et où est-ce qu'on pourrait se retrouver si jamais les gens ne respectent pas les règles que vous leur donnez? Alors, euh, l'idée vraiment, c'est de... On s'en tient encore, on a encore tout à fait confiance euh, dans la rédaction des Canadiens. On voit à quel point les gens euh, respectent la règle, ils comprennent que c'est important de rester à la maison parce qu'ils peuvent présenter une menace pour les gens qu'ils aiment. Donc, c'est pas juste de comment nous, on se sent, mais c'est vraiment est-ce qu'on est à risque d'infecter sans le savoir une personne qui pourrait être plus vulnérable. 
Et euh, aussi longtemps que les gens vont collaborer, euh, c'est ce que nous, comme gouvernement, on souhaite voir, évidemment, si on s'aperçoit qu'il y a de la négligence et que ça finit par poser un risque, c'est là qu'on peut être mis dans une situation où il faut prendre des décisions beaucoup plus contraignantes pour les citoyens et ce n'est pas ce qu'on souhaite. Alors vraiment, la collaboration des gens est extrêmement importante. Quand on revient de voyage, quand on présente des symptômes, il faut absolument s'isoler. Et de la même façon, il y a une solidarité qui doit aussi s'établir, une solidarité qui est sociale, virtuelle, dans la mesure du possible. Mais euh, j'en profite pour encore une fois remercier tous les travailleurs de la santé, tous les travailleurs du secteur agricole qui doivent aller au travail le matin, tout en prenant euh, tout, plein de précautions pour se protéger. Mais on a besoin qu'ils soient au travail pour fournir des soins et pour aussi nous nourrir. But follow up. Thank you. Okay. Um, no, our next question would be from David Akin. The question question is David Akin from Global News. Uh, good afternoon, ministers. Uh, question for Minister Haidu, and then a quick one for Minister Champagne, and this will be all I have. For Minister Haidu, we've got reports that some meatpacking plants in Montreal and southwestern Ontario could process more animals and are telling their producers, farmers, not to send them animals because there is a shortage of uh, food inspectors from the CFIA. The reason there's a shortage, they're being told, is because of a previous existing, uh, I guess, bureaucratic initiative from the CFIA to reduce the amount of overtime being paid to meat inspectors. I wonder if you've had a chance to review what the CFIA is doing to make sure they have enough people in plants. And the quick question from Minister Champagne, following up, I think, on something that the Prime Minister said, that in, uh, it, around the world, as we're trying to get repatriated Canadians home, one of the issues is we need to have sort of a critical mass of Canadians in any one place to get on a flight or something like that. Is there a rough number of the, quote, critical mass of Canadians you might need in City A or Airport B in order to try to get people home? Minister Heidi first, perhaps? It's Minister Bibo. We uh, share this responsibility with CFIA, and I had a chance to have a good conversation with the President yesterday on this specific subject, on the capacity of uh, CFIA to um, be uh, in the field and have the inspectors doing their job. It's true that we have a challenging situation in terms of our human resources capacity right now. Uh, we are all humans, and some of our staff uh, must be isolated as well. So right now what we are doing is really to um, see where are the priorities amongst the priorities. We are collaborating with the industry to identify that. We are collaborating with the provinces as well to see how we can share uh, some responsibilities, some personnel as well, where uh, we can, uh, you know, just extend maybe some inspection for certain sector. but. Uh, food safety will always be uh, the top priority for uh, CFI, and uh, we take it very seriously. So there's a, there's a challenge in terms of capacity, but we are working it out right now. And, and David, uh, to, your, to your next question, I think, uh, you know, what we're doing is, is uh, really uh, return flight facilitation, because these people who are going to be boarding these planes, if they meet the health uh, requirements, will have to pay also commercial fare. Uh, to, to, to come home. And um, so I would say that uh, we see in various hotspots, as we've called them, uh, several hundred uh, uh, of Canadians who want to come home. But uh, we will adjust with offer and demand. I mean, there's obviously in, in a number of places where we're looking a spike. And it's really based upon the challenges that people are experiencing. Because let's me, let me be clear to, to Canadians who are watching and those who are listening. Uh, there are still a number of commercial flights uh, for Canadians to come back home. Uh, it might not be from their actual location to their uh, scheduled destination, but people should be looking at, at ways to come back to Canada. What we're doing now is really to facilitate uh, a number of flights where we have seen that countries have imposed a number of restrictions, which is making it extremely difficult uh, for people who would be willing to come back to Canada. Uh, but are prevented from coming back to Canada just because the set of circumstances on, under which they're operating does not allow that. So, yes, there are a number of odd spots because countries have not imposed uh, the same amount of restrictions. Like I said, uh, 
a number of airspace are still open, a number of airports are still open, a, a number of countries have maintained uh, facilitation for people to cross and perhaps go in another country uh, to take a flight back home. Uh, but we will certainly look at the hotspots and see the set of uh, restrictions that are imposed. That's how we are uh, looking at the situation, making sure that those which are the most vulnerable, uh, we could help and bring back home. Okay, I think we've had thank you. all questions. So thank you, folks.